700 years after his death, Dante's relationship with music remains unfinished business. Dante understood the term music in at least three distinct senses. First, music as one of four disciplines of the quadrivium, the other three being arithmetic, geometry, and astronomy. In the context of the quadrivium, music was the study of numbers in time. And as such, it provided a window onto the intrinsic harmony of the universe as created by God. Second, Dante used the term music to refer to the rhythmic rules that regulate language, and in particular, poetic language. Poetry differs from ordinary language, as well as written prose, in that it is organized rhythmically. Rhythmic organization allows poetry to exhibit a, a metaphorical harmony between its uh, different components. This is created through the use of cadences, the choice of the phonetic quality of the words employed, the number of syllables deployed in each verse, and the organization of verses in larger units of three, four, five, even bigger units, uh, otherwise known as stanzas, all of which um, creates uh, a musical structure. And Dante is very clear in the, the Vulgari Eloquentia that poetry is musical in and of itself, irrespective of whether it's set to music or not, irrespective of whether it is spoken or sung. Third, Dante used the term music the way we do, namely to refer to the music that accompanies everyday life or marks special occasions. There is no doubt that Dante cared deeply about music and was responsive to it because he left very moving um, descriptions of the impact of music on him and his companions uh, in his journey toward heaven in the Divine Comedy, and in particular in the second canticle, the Purgatory, as well as the Paradise. Significantly, there is no music in hell, where one hears only environmental noises and the screams of the souls. Dante's poetry was not very well served by composers. Indeed, only about a dozen musical settings, mostly madrigals, emerged only in the 16th century, that is, a full 200 years after the poet's own death. and the most significant of them by the likes of Marenzio or Merulo, not until the end of the 1500s, that's almost 300 years uh, after the beginning of the journey that Dante recounts in the Divine Comedy, that is 1300. The third canto of the Inferno is featured as many as seven times, and it is worth looking at in order to understand why here sighs and lamentations and loud cries were echoing across the starless air, so that as soon as I set out, I wept. Strange utterances, horrible pronouncements, accents of anger, words of suffering, and voices shrill and faint, and beating hands, all went to make a tumult that will whirl forever through that turbid, timeless air, like sand that eddies when a whirlwind swirls. The strong images well suited the composer's interest in imitating particular words through musical means, what we know as um, text painting or madrigalisms. The passage is also interesting in that it features a soundscape, namely a sonic uh, environment, and the impact that the sounds have uh, on the poet. Uh, these are key elements in understanding the role of sound of music in the Divine Comedy, and clearly uh, they resonated with late 16th century composers. Dante is absent in much 17th and 18th century music, though he inspired a very important experiment by Vincenzo Galileo, Galileo's father, who set Ugolino's Lament from the last canto of the Inferno 
to what he thought was an attempt at a imitating Greek monody, and possibly was a progenitor of what came to be known as recitative in opera. This setting, however, is lost. We also know that Dante's Inferno had a significant impact on the composition and uh, writing of the libretto for Orfeo by Monteverdi Strigio, uh, which is one of the earliest and uh, certainly the most significant of the early operas. Um, so that alone uh, places Dante in a very important position in music history. Having said that, it is not until the 19th century that Dante and his poetry begin to figure prominently in some major works, uh, particularly in instrumental music, by the likes of Liszt and Tchaikovsky, and subsequently, in the form of an opera, Zandonai's Francesca da Rimini. Uh, it is mostly Inferno that inspires composers, and in particular the episode which involves Francesca da Rimini, Inferno Canto V. Um, this too is mediated by a very rich iconographical tradition, as well as the impact of Wagner's Stringstein on Isolde, which, uh, like the story of Francesca, is a story of betrayal and romantic love. All in all, Dante's presence in music history cannot be compared to his role in the iconographical tradition and the history of painting. I'm thinking about illustrations by the likes of Botticelli, Blake, Salvador Dali. There's very little uh, that compares to the frequency and significance of the artwork produced in response to the poem. The one area in which Dante inspired almost an excess of um, responses um, is commentary, interpretation. And the subject of music and sound emerges in uh, uh, interpretations of the Divine Comedy in particular um, only in the 1960s. And of late, it's become also uh, a spotlight in literary criticism uh, as well. Before we approach the question of the role of music, and particularly the role of listening in the comedy, we ought to remember, uh, no pun intended, that the Divine Comedy is a work of memory, and that therefore music and sound are either remembered or used as poetic devices to call up other images, other aspects of Dante's journey. We should also remember that Dante never describes sounds as such. Rather, he dwells on the impact that they have on him. So there is less interest in the objective manifestation of musical sound than there is in the attempt to recover the impressions that these sounds had on him. Which is why I believe an investigation of music in the Divine Comedy is more proper along the lines of aesthetics rather than composition or performance. As we begin our investigation of Dante as a listener, let us first consider instances in which Dante uses music as a term or key metaphor in referring to something else. Music not so much as heard, but rather as a term in one of his often elaborate similes. Take, for example, Dante's entrance into Purgatory proper in Canto 9 of the Purgatory, and the way in which he describes the sounds that the gate makes as it's being opened. Hearing that gate resound, I turned, attentive. I seemed to hear inside, in words that mingled with gentle music, Te Deum Laudamus. And what I heard gave me the very same impression one is used to getting when one hears a song accompanied by organ. And now the words are clear, and now are lost. This analogy between the sound of the gate and the sound of an organ happens in the here and now 
of the poetic recreation of his journey. So it happens in the present time, and by extension, the present time of reading. As the custodian opens the gate, Dante hears soul singing the Te Deum. So there is an admixture of sounds here, a noise, if you wish, made by a metal structure, and singing going on inside, far away. Dante makes an analogy between this particular combination and the combination or balance or lack thereof between a voice and an organ in a church performance. It's an extremely elaborate analogy actually and it also strikes one as the only element in this particular uh, uh, segment of the poem that conveys a sense of the gate as a concrete physical object. Dante, through this very complex analogy between two simultaneous uh, sounds, also calls to mind um, a divided attention, namely the fact that uh, his attention is moving back and forth between two different streams of sound. And that attention and the way in which he negotiates the sonic environment around him shapes his experience of the space he's crossing and the significance of the people he meets along his journey. Sometimes musical analogies are used not to refer to sounds, but rather to indicate a process, a state, or symbolically refer to communion and reconciliation. I'm thinking in particular of paradise and the way in which uh, uh, images of harmony uh, indicate uh, a particular um, situation uh, in the souls themselves, but also in their relationship to God. Some of these analogies also feature musical instruments, especially chordophone instruments like the lyre, the harp, the citra, all of which can be traced to a mythical instrument, David's psaltery, which, which is symbolic of divine music making and as such of the harmony that reigns over paradise. The range and quality of it, the references to music vary from canticle to canticle in the Divine Comedy. In Inferno, as I've mentioned earlier, there is virtually no music. What Inferno features, rather, is a kind of anti-music, a parody, a perverse mirror reflection of music uh, as we know it, and also music as a symbol of harmony in the paradise. Let us look at some examples of such anti-music as found in Inferno. Raphael Mai Ameke Zahi Almi began to bellow that brute mouth for which no sweeter psalms would be appropriate. And my guide turned to him, O oh, stupid soul, keep to your horn and use that as an outlet when rage or other passion touches you. The first thirset refers to Nimrod, who sings what to Dante sounds like an inverted image of a psalm, incomprehensible and most likely um, horrible to the ear. Uh, Virgil, who's attempting to distract Dante from Nimrod, also mentions the fact that he has a horn. And this is the only musical instrument that Dante actually sees and encounters in the entire canticle. There is, in the previous canto, a very pointed reference to an instrument. Only this reference is used to make an analogy. And this is what Dante says. I saw one who'd be fashioned like a lute if he had only had his groin cut off from that part of his body where it forks. Here, among the falsifiers, Dante is referring to Master Adam. And it is striking that in order to give us a concrete sense of what he looked like, he uses an image of an instrument, which is in a sense an insult to music itself. But this is in line with the idea that the absence of music or the perversion of music in Inferno is a form of punishment for dance souls. 
in the same canto in the tenth bolgia, Dante again returns to Master Adam as he begins to argue with the fellow soul in order to convey the sense of just how taut, tense Adam's belly was. So taut, so tense, that on touching it, it sounds like a drum. Let me read the relevant passage. And one of them, who seemed to take offense, perhaps at being named so squalidly, struck with his fist at Adam's rigid belly. It sounded as if it had been a drum. And Master Adam struck him in the face using his arm, which did not seem less hard. Again, what's fascinating here, I think, is the idea that it takes a sound, and a musical sound in particular, the sound of a musical instrument, a drum, to convey a concrete sense of what Dante is witnessing. Uh, which is to say, too, that music and musical references, and references to listening and sound, are subsumed in the Divine Comedy under an attempt to portray this world realistically. In the 22nd Canto of Inferno, another parody, the parody of a well-ordered army, which is to say, a musically ordered army. Let me read. Before this I've seen horsemen start to march, and open the assault and master ranks, and seen them too at times beat their retreat. And on your land, or Aretines, I've seen rangers and raiding parties galloping, the clash of tournaments, the rush of jousts. Now down with trumpets, now with bells, and now with drums, and now with signs from castle walls, with native things, and with imported ware. But never yet have I seen horsemen or seen infantry or ship that says by signal of land or star move to so strange a bugle. Dante speaks in a mock heroic register here, addressing corruption. His target is the city of Arezzo in particular. Notice the contrast between this image of discord and the opposite, an image of harmony and core chord in Purgatory. The lovely lady who helped me ford Lethe, an iron statues following the wheel that turned right round the inner smaller arc, were slowly passing through the tall woods, empty because of one who had believed the serpent. Our pace was measured by angelic song. This image of music providing the pulse of the situation, but also ordering the space in which Dante is moving across, is foreshadowing uh, the harmony of the paradise. Notwithstanding this foreshadowing of paradise, in the purgatory, music is penitential, therapeutical in nature. Uh, I'm referring primarily to the psalms sung by the repenting souls as they begin and continue their journey toward the Garden of Eden. Music is also featured at the entrance of each of the seven terraces as sung by angels, the Beatitudes. Finally, Purgatory also features two moments of musical performance which are not symptomatic of the purgatory and as such could be treated as deceptive kinds of music. First, the canzone sung by Casella, Dante's friend, in the second canto. And secondly, the siren song evoked by Dante as he retells a dream in canto 19. In canto 2 of purgatory, Dante hears the souls being shipped toward purgatory sing a psalm. The helmsman sent from heaven at the stern seemed to have blessedness inscribed upon him. More than a hundred spirits sat within. In Exito Israel de Egypto, with what is written after of that psalm, all of those spirits sang as with one voice. The emphasis here is duo, is on the fact that a hundred souls sing as one, rather like in the manner of Gregorian chant, and the symbolic, of course, connotations of the singing as one body. But also the nature of the psalm itself, 
which draws an analogy between the Israelites freeing themselves from the bondage of Egypt and repenting souls freeing themselves from the bondage of sin. Also in the second canto of the Purgatory, of course, one finds the celebrated and indeed very moving encounter between Dante and his old friend and musician, Casella, who sings for him a canzone that Dante himself had included in the Convivio. Love that discourses to me in my mind, he then began to sing, and sang so sweetly that I still hear that sweetness sound in me. My master, I, and all that company around the singer seemed so satisfied as if no other thing might touch our minds. We all were motionless and fixed upon the notes, when all at once the grave old man cried out, What have we here, you laggard spirits? What negligence, what lingering is this? Quick, to the mountain, to cast off this love that will not let you see God show himself. There are several points of interest embedded in this wonderful passage. First of all, the fact that Casella, Dante's old friend, is made palpable thanks to his singing, thanks to the sound of his voice. He's a ghost otherwise, and Dante tries three times to embrace him without any success. And the lack of warmth, uh, that absence of the sensation of a body touching the body of a friend, is as it were compensated by Casella's musical performance. Uh, remember too that in evoking uh, the lack of materiality of Casella's body in the Purgatory, Dante is also making a reference to Virgil's Aeneid and the famous passage in which Aeneas tries without success to embrace the lost loved ones. Also of interest is of course the fact that Casella decides to sing a poem by Dante himself. And this is of course his cast under a negative light. Cato's reproach, Cato's remark to the effect that they should stop listening to the music and get on with more important business has to do with the fact that Dante here is sinning in a sense, is indulging too much in celebration of his own work as a poet. Third, and by no means least, Dante is evoking the power of music here and the way in which beautiful singing generates complete absorption on the part of the listeners. There is a running theme here in Purgatory, uh, one that deals with uh, music as a form of seduction and the senses in general as something that lead one astray from one's mission from one's destiny. Um, and this returns in the Canto 19 of Purgatory, for example, in the famous dream in which Dante imagines hearing the siren that also enchanted Ulysses during his journey and led him astray, or almost. And here too there is an intertextual relationship between the Divine Comedy and the Odyssey by Homer, a somewhat self-important, if you wish, comparison being made by Dante's own pilgrimage and Odysseus or Ulysses' journey. Here is the relevant passage from Purgatory, Canto 19. And when her speech had been set free, then she began to sing so that it would have been most difficult for me to turn aside. I am, she sang, I am the pleasing siren, who in mid-sea leads mariners astray, there is so much delight in hearing me. I turned aside Ulysses, although he had longed to journey, who grows used to me seldom departs, I satisfy him so. Her lips were not yet done when, there beside me, a woman showed herself, alert and saintly, to cast the siren into much confusion. And I'm interested in this passage also because it suggests, once again, a divided attention, or at least a transition from one state to another, from Dante intent upon listening to the siren and him being distracted by another figure that emerges, a more saintly female figure that turns his attention away from the siren singing. 
Dante was remembering a dream there and recasting what he remembered from that dream with the help of sonic images. There's another very important reference to music in Purgatory in Canto 32, and it too has something to do with sleep, or at least drowsiness. And this is what Dante says as he enters the Garden of Eden. I did not understand the hymn that they then sang. It is not sung here on this earth, nor drowsy did I listen to the end. In this seemingly transitional, but in fact very important tercet, Dante uses a musical reference to convey a sense of time passing and also a sense of the space he occupies. Also important is the reference to the fact that he cannot quite grasp the music as he himself acknowledges, which hints at a music beyond comprehension, the kind of music he will encounter in paradise. Indeed, in paradise, music is elusive, ineffable. It may or may not be grasped by the pilgrim, and it doesn't tell us exactly how much he actually understands of what he's hearing. Which makes discussions of whether the music he refers to in paradise is monophonic, polyphonic, or otherwise, somewhat speculative. We really don't know what Dante is listening to. And he himself is keen to, as it were, paint a veil between himself and the sources of the music uh, that accompany his journey uh, through paradise and toward the Empyrean. Consider the following example from the sixth canto of Paradise. Thus does the living justice make so sweet the sentiments in us that we are free of any turning toward iniquity. Different voices join to sound sweet music, so do the different orders in our life render sweet harmony among these spheres. And in this very pearl there also shines the light of Romeo, of one whose acts, though great and noble, met ungratefulness. This is Justinian speaking to Dante, having just recounted the history of Rome and justified it retrospectively as preparing the advent of Christianity. Notice how the reference to music marks a transition between the subject of Rome and divine justice and the subject of Romeo, a nobleman from Provence who was unjustly treated by the members of his community. In a sense, the musical reference functions like a cross fade in a film. The music Dante hears enables him to write a smooth transition out of the history of Rome and into the story of Romeo. Notice too how the words that Dante uses may suggest that this is actually a form of polyphonic singing. It remains difficult to determine whether Dante refers to polyphony in these as well as other passages because of the lack of clarity of his terminology. Not that that's a necessarily a criticism, um, it's just that he does not feel the need to be more specific about what is being performed, about the kinds of singing that's happening. Uh, we don't know whether Dante refers here to organum, which is a form of improvised singing over a tenor, or whether he's referring to polyphony in the modern sense of the term, namely rhythmically independent vocal lines. So the question raised, for instance, by Ciabattoni, whether the Divine Comedy traces a progress from noise or cacophony to polyphony via monophony in the purgatory must remain an open one. There is another example of ineffable, almost ungraspable music in Paradise. We are in the heaven of justice, and this is what Dante writes. For then all of those living lights grew more resplendent, but the songs that they began were label, they escaped my memory. O oh, gentle love that wears a smile as mantle, how ardent was your image in those torches, fit only with the breath of holy thoughts. Dante writes this in preparation of the appearance of the eagle of justice, and a major theme uh, in this canto 
is the fact that divine justice cannot be fully comprehended by the human mind. And that Dante, the pilgrim on behalf of humanity, so to speak, has to accept these limitations and live with it. In a sense, and this is why the musical reference is important, this is anticipated in the first verse that I read, when Dante says that the music, the songs were la labeled and that they escaped Dante's memory. This is an anticipation, a foreshadowing of the larger theme of the inability to grasp and the inability to remember everything that needs to be remembered as one uh, approaches the difficult subject of divine justice. The final image of paradise and with it the poem is musicless, notwithstanding a reference to the will and therefore a reference to the cyclicality of time. It is appropriate that there is no music here as Dante can barely see nor hear the fire and the light under which everything is subsumed. For where there is no time and no space, there can be no music.